Hello. Uh, Mr. Grant? Yeah, right. <laughs> this is Chet Falzerano. Yeah. Is this a better time for you? Yeah, sure. Okay, great, great. I should also start off by telling you I interviewed Louis Belson last week. Uh-huh. And he said to say hello. He, uh, yeah. He thought very fondly of you. He, he felt as if you were actually family to him. That's, yeah, that's right. And he felt bad that uh, he had lost contact with you, so um, um, if you don't mind, I'm going to send him your phone number so that he, he seemed yeah. anxious to want to contact you again. You know, when Pearl died last year, I tried to write him, and I, I couldn't find an address for him, and so I, my, I, I couldn't uh, follow up on it. So if you do talk to him, you might just say that uh, what I just said to you that uh, I tried to contact and write him, but had no address. Sure, sure. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like this uh, to be kind of free form. Whatever comes to your mind, you're, you, you know, you're welcome to talk about. Um, I do have a, a few questions, though, so maybe we could start with that. Yep. Um, tell me when you first started with Gresh. 1946. Okay. Um, now, William F. Ludwig was quoted as saying that you and um, uh, Fred Gresh Jr. reserved a suite at the Sherman Hotel in Chicago in 1940 to show the Gladstone drum. So that obviously was... Uh, That's not correct. Not correct, yes. No. Okay. Uh, Bill, Bill Ludwig gets mixed up. Yes. <laughs> yeah, don't we all? As we get older, it seems like that... Oh, uh, uh, no, no, I wasn't even with the company then. So you started after the war, is that correct? Yeah, right, yeah. What service were you in? What branch of the The Navy. I was a communication officer on the troop transports in the South Pacific. I see. Now, you were quite an accomplished musician before you even went into the Navy. Is that correct? Correct. You were with the Goldman Band? Yes. How many years were you with them? Oh, well, before the war, it was three, and then after the war, it was another... Another 15, maybe. Hmm. Now, what year were you born? How old were you when uh, when you went into the into the Navy? Oh, I must have been... My birth date is August 12, 1914. I have nothing to hide. <laughs> and uh, when I went in the Navy, I must have been 27 or 8. I see. Now, um, tell me what position you took with the company when you, when you started with Gresh. Well, I was a, a promotional man for the drums, and, uh, and then I worked inside doing office work, and I was then they put me on the uh, road selling, selling the general line of Gretsch, which included the guitars, drums, and uh, all sorts of accessories. So I was a part-time salesman and part-time promotional man for the drums. I see. Now, 46 was also a year that was memorable for Louis Belson because that's when he put together his first double bass kit with Gresh. Oh, geez, I don't think it was in 46. I didn't meet Louis until... I gotta re rely on my memory, but uh, 46 was way too early. I don't think I met Louis till 47 or 48. I gotta go back and retrace them to where he would have been in 1946. You know, he was just a kid. Right. Uh, and his first, see, his first big gig was with, let's see, was it with Tommy Dorsey? No, Benny Goodman. That's right, Benny Goodman. Yeah, that was in uh, 42, and apparently that's when he got his first contact with Gresh. He was uh, he told me that he was a Slingel endorser prior to that, but Goodman had a uh, had a deal with uh, with Gresh, and being only 17, he said, you know, he didn't want to create any waves. And, and so well, he, yeah. Now, this is all before my time with Gretsch. You understand? Right. Right. Now, um... Now, see... Uh, the company had an agreement with, with 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 Benny that whoever played the drums in the band would play Gretsch drums. Right. Yeah. One of the names that uh, that uh, Louis said that I should uh, ask you about is Emerson Strong. Yeah. 
He said, now, Emerson probably isn't still alive because he said he was pretty old at the time. Yeah, Emerson died in 19... Oh, around 52 or 53. 1953, so at that time he was around 60. He was the vice president of the company. Hmm. What, is it, what was his area of specialty? What, what, what did he do? Well, he was in charge of the advertising, and uh, he ran the office. That's about it. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Fred Grush Jr. was at the helm, I guess. Well, I can know. I guess it was, was it Bill that was in charge when you first went to work for the company? Well, Fred had just got out of the Navy, and he came back into the company, but Bill was running it during the war, so I guess I, you'd have to say that Bill was running at that time, yes. Bill hired me. Uh -huh. Now, when Fred came back, what capacity was he at the time? Because he was president before he left, is that correct? Of course, you wouldn't know that you weren't with the company. But... I, I don't know. Uh, when he came back, he was uh, automatic. His father, I think, was president during the... In, during the war, you know, his father was wasn't while well, he was uh, maybe not working in the company full time. He was he was probably president, and Bill was vice president. And then when Fred came back, he then became the president. I see. I see. Um, he also said to mention the Peter Luger restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, that's where you guys got together a lot. Yeah. Well, we always had lunch up there. Peter Luger is a very famous uh, restaurant. They had uh, two uh, two restaurants in Brooklyn. One there, that was the original one. There was another Peter Luger downtown in Brooklyn. But this is uh, this is the the famous Peter Luger. And it was right around the corner from. The it was Broadway. walking distance. Uh huh. Just three or four blocks, but it was w easy walk. Uh huh. Um. If you would, I'd like to mention some some of the artists. Now, you were you were, I guess, kind of artist relations people with the company. Is that correct? That's correct. I did all the I did all the artistship, all of it. Okay. Uh, if if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to just mention some names, and you could tell me about either the person or the way he played or the equipment that he liked or anything that you that just happens to pop in your mind. Okay. Billy Gladstone. Well, Billy Gladstone. was probably the the best snare drummer in the country and i was second and billy gladstone was a wonderful guy he was a brilliant man he was an inventor he invented a lot of things and besides the drums he invented a baton that the conductor at the radio city uh, music hall used the baton when he picked it up it had a battery and it would light up so that the fellows in the pit could uh, could follow the conductor better then he had a patent on his Gladstone snare drum, uh, the three-way patent, uh, the uh, and a three-way key. One key tightened the top head, one key part of the key tightened the bottom head, and the third part of the key tightened tightened both heads. Are you with Are you with me? Oh yeah. Now yeah. I, had, I had a question about this particular area, and I'd like to interrupt here if I may. Now, yeah. He went into partnership with Gresh prior to war to make the Gresh Gladstone drum. Is that correct? Um, I, I don't know what the original uh, agreement was with uh, Billy Gladstone and Gretsch, because when I came there, he would come over and uh, assemble his drums there. In other words, uh, we, we made the, <coughs> the shells, we made the hoops, we made the rods, and he, he assembled them. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know what his financial uh, agreement was. I never d did get into that because at that time it, w it was none of my business probably. And uh, all I know is that he would come over to the plant and uh, tinker around and, uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and put his drums together. But he couldn't put them together because we had all, I mean, any other place, because we had all the parts. Mm -hmm. Now, why was it, do you think, that he liked the, the Gresh shell so much? Well, first of all, it, it isn't only that he liked them. I think everybody liked them. Uh, 
we're the only ones that use that uh, the, the six ply shell. We got it from Jasper, Jasper out in Indiana, and all the other companies had a three ply shell with all the three plies coming together at one spot, and they had to put lining hoops in because the three ply shell wouldn't hold up. Now our six ply shells were were uh, 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 are molded with six at six different places on the shell rather than one place on the three-ply shells that uh, Ludwig and Slingland had. Yes. And, and, they, and so we didn't have a lining. It wasn't necessary to put in a lining hoop. So you had a perfect shell there rather than the shell that uh, you were losing some of your head space there because the lining hoop was actually taking up part of your shell. You follow me? Yes. Okay. Now, originally the shells were done in three-ply and staggered joints, is that correct? Not that I know of. As soon as I was there, they were six-ply and they came in from Jasper. Hmm. Okay. Now, uh, during the war, you know, they, uh, all those things happened and I wasn't there then, so they could have been made in three-ply shells or something, I, I don't know. Okay. Um, how about Joe Jones? Joe? J.O. Jones? Yes, Papa Joe. Yeah, well... He thinks he invented uh, Count Basie. <laughs> He's a su supreme egotist. He's a, he a nice guy, a big band drummer, supreme, and uh, quite a personality. He either liked him a lot or he didn't like his, he hated his guts. Uh, Joe and I were, were good friends. I, he, came, we, uh, he and his wife came out to my house a few times and we were very good friends. And he was, uh, he was a very dominating t sort of a guy. You know, physically, and uh, he'd talk a lot, and, and his but playing with Basie was superb. Hmm. How about uh, O'Neill Spencer? Did you have any experience with him? No, no, didn't know him. Okay, Nick Fatul. Nick Fatul, that was before my time. Davy Tuff. Dave Tuff. Okay, yeah. I knew him very well. And uh, I went along with him on the 18-inch uh, bass drum. He was playing down at Eddie Condon's in the village with a small band, a small group. He'd always been in big bands before. This is his first venture into small groups. I guess he wanted to stay in New York. He was tired of the road. So he was down at Eddie Condon. I used to go down and see him. And so we made an 18-inch bass drum for him. And uh, he was a Gretsch booster for quite a number of years till his death. Now, was it an 18 or a 20? Do you recall? Because in the catalogs, it says that he developed the 20-inch bass drum, but I've found a lot of times the catalogs are incorrect. Well, that may be, that may be what it was. It was a small one, though. Yeah. Right. Right. It was the smallest bass drum we had made at that time. Now, maybe, I guess it was a 20. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A very sweet guy, Dave. Shelly Mann. Oh, Shelly. Well, he was a big promoter, Shelly. He was a good good musician, and he promoted himself very well. He was a good band drummer with Stan Kenton. We was with him for years. A nice guy, and uh, very aggressive sort of personality. He played aggressively with Stan. And uh, I don't know, when Stan broke up, I think Shelley went to California, and I, I sort of lost track of him. I guess he was doing uh, picture work out there, recordings and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But I lost track of him after he left Stan Kenton, more or less lost track of him. How about Dick Shanahan with Charlie Burnett? Well, I, I can't remember him very well, that's for sure. Okay, what about George Wetling? George, yeah. He was a, oh, he was a, he was with jo uh, Paul Whiteman for a while, and uh, George was an overrated drummer. He wasn't all that good. He, he played him with some with big bands, but uh, his technique was not good at all. And uh, I, I don't know. I just think he got by on the name that wasn't as good as uh, what he thought it was. Hmm. 
interesting. How about Kenny Clark? Kenny Clark. Yeah, I so wish Kenny had stayed in the United States, but Kenny was, uh, he had a thing for Europe, and particularly Paris. And uh, when I went over to Paris a couple of times, Kenny was always there playing at the, uh, what the hell club was that? Blue Note? Mm -hmm. And Klug, they called him. Right. And he was a good drummer. But I didn't know him that well because he didn't spend enough time in the United States for me to, to, to get real palsy with him. Mm -hmm. How about Shadow Wilson? Shadow uh, was with Basie, and uh, let's see what happened to him. I forget. He died prematurely? Mm -hmm. Huh? Yes. Yeah. He died pretty young. That's what Louis said, yeah. Didn't know too much about him. He was a good big band drummer. But uh, we didn't. We weren't with him too long because of of the. Uh, I, I think he was sick or something. But anyway, I didn't know Shadow that well. About your experience with Louis Belson, he sure talked a lot about you. <laughs> yeah. Well, L Louis uh, got influenced by some people. <laughs> Uh, 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 there was a while that he was anti Phil Grant and anti Gretsch. It was more or less of a mis misunderstanding. But Louis was easily swayed by people, and he was swayed by the people out in the West Coast, of Los Angeles. Uh, I can't think of their names right. They were in the drum shop out there, and he would spend a lot of time there. And I think that what what they told him was sort of Louis got turned off against me. But uh, Louis was a great innovator. The two bass drum thing and all the rest, and uh, he was one of the kindest, sweetest guys I ever met in my life, and an excellent drummer. And he's the kind of drummer that everybody looked up to, regardless of what phase of the drumming you were in. You'd look up to Louis because he had hands that wouldn't stop and feet that wouldn't stop. Excellent drummer. So that set of his was pretty innovative for its time, is that correct? Oh, yes, it was. He was way ahead of his time. Since then, there were quite a few big band drummers that went to the two bass drums, but uh, uh, most of them didn't know why the second bass drum was there. <laughs> <laughs> Except it looked good. <laughs> yeah, it does make quite an impression. Now, he showed me the picture of the first set that, that he put together with Gresh, and it had uh, a tom in the front, almost looked like a cocktail drum. He said it was 18 by 24. Strange looking drum, very, uh, looked like, a, like I said, a cocktail drum. Well, 18 by 24, yeah. the 24 I would believe, but the 18 I think it's a little, would probably a little bit wide. We didn't, at that time we didn't have an 18 inch die cast hoop, a metal hoop. Mm-hmm. But I, it looked smaller, like I said, it looked more like a cocktail drum, which would have been between 14 and 16, but, but uh, yeah. I believe he said it was, was 18, but he might have been mistaken, but it was kind of an odd-looking drum sitting between those two huge bass drums. It wasn't the, the two small toms that uh, mounted on the bass drum then, huh? The 13 by 9s mounted on the bass drum? Not this uh, not this set that he showed me, and he claimed that was the first one. Well, I, I, then I, I, I don't remember that then. Okay, okay. How about a fellow by the name of Denzel Best? Just a casual acquaintance. I don't think we ever advertised Denzel. If we did, it was very uh, brief. Okay. Now these are all obviously Gresh. You know, at one time Gresh endorsers, and, and you know, if, if if you don't have anything to say about him, I I, st I totally understand. But I know you'll have something to say about Don Lamont. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Don was one of those guys in the big band. He was great. Don Lamont, who was a big band drummer. But you put him out in a small group, and and he, he didn't function nearly as well. Uh, as far as a technician, it was just average. But he had that big band feeling about him. You know, he knew he knew how to, to, to take a big band and lift it and push it. And uh, he lived in Long Island, not far from me. And we used him a couple times on clinics, whatnot. But uh, he wasn't didn't impress the drummers too much, other than, you know, when he got away from the big band scene, he wasn't that impressive, because uh, 
his technique was just so so. You know, when you get away on, on a small band, your your technique shows. You know, the big band, you can sit back and and uh, play the riffs and do all that, and and your technique's not going to show up. But in the small group, when they expect you to do a couple solos and things like that, and show off a little bit and take your part of the uh, of the group, that, that wasn't for Don. We never used him at Gretsch Birdland, uh, Gretsch Drum Night at Birdland, for that reason. Let's talk about that now. That's a very thing that, a very interesting thing that I know you were uh, deeply involved in. Yeah. Well, f first of all, I was impressed with Birdland because you could go down there and they had a they had a gallery section, and those people you could get under the into the gallery section if you were under 21. So a lot of drummers would go down there and sit in the gallery section, and they didn't have to buy anything, and they could just watch the, uh, the, the uh, listen, watch the music, and that impressed me very much. And I liked the the management of, of Birdland. And first thing you know, I was down there quite a bit, and then I suggested that uh, during the summer, it was during the one that we had the, the musical uh, conventions there that we uh, have a great drum night at Birdland. And uh, I would hire the drummers, they would hire the other musicians, and the drummers would be featured. And uh, one time I had a gimmick that uh, anybody that uh, uh, brought a, a great snare drum down could get in free. And <laughs> the hat check girl, I had a tipper because they had about 15 great snare drums in the hat check thing there. <laughs> then uh, the owner of the Birdland, and, and people got a wrong impression of why it was called Birdland. They, they thought it was because of Charlie Bird. But if, if it had been named after Charlie Bird, I'm sure Charlie Bird's widow would have sued the, the Birdland uh, for, uh, for all the, uh, <laughs> for a lot of financial things because of, of the use of his name. But the fact was that when uh, Morris Levy, who was president of Roulette Records, bought Birdland, there was a nightclub there, and there were a bunch of birds in the cage. So uh, Morris says, we'll call it Birdland. That's how it's got its name. <laughs> now, is that who you dealt with at Birdland, was Morris? Well, I, 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 did, uh, I, I, did, I dealt with Mar uh, uh, Oscar Goodstein, who was the manager of Birdland. He, Oscar and I were good friends, and anything I wanted, I'd take it up with Oscar. And then... Uh, uh, and then when uh, the thing got uh, second second year or so, it got pretty big. So I went to uh, to uh, to uh, Morris Levy, and I said, Morris, I think that if you if we if we recorded this, it would sell big. So Morris Levy had some kind thoughts about me, and he said, Okay, we'll do it. So we had Gretsch died to Birdland number one, and that sold very well. They made money on it, Bird, uh, Roulette did. So we had a, a the second time, we did a uh, Gretsch drum night at Birdland number two, and that sold pretty well. But of course, the second one generally doesn't sell as well as the original. Those are collector's items now. I've, I've got the number one. I'm, I'm still trying to find the number two. And, and, and Capitol Records, which now is, uh, has taken over Roulette years ago, um, has re-released it on CD. Really? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. I can't remember all the drummers that were on Gretsch Drum Night at Birdland. I really can't. Well, one of them is, is the next one on my list here. It was Mel Lewis. I know he was one. Yeah. Tell me about Mel. Well, Mel, I first got to know Mel in Buffalo where he was a high school student. And uh, he uh, he would come to the, to the clinics where I performed. And, and uh, he came... Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Stan Kent. Oh, Shelley left Stan Kenton. I wrote Stan Kenton a letter, and I said that I know how Shelley plays, and Mel Lewis, I think, would be the closest drummer that you could hire to take to take uh, Shelley Mann's place. That that that. that that Stan Kenton's band would go through a, an easy transition with Mel playing drums. And by God, he, he took my advice and hired Mel, and Mel was with Stan, I don't know how many years. And Mel was um, was a good big band drummer, and uh, 
he wasn't, a, you know, he's, he wasn't a soloist. He didn't have that uh, the amount of technique available to him. His hands weren't, weren't that great. But he made up from that by his knowledge of music and his filling in, just like Shelley did. In other words, Shelley wasn't a great uh, technician either. But he was able to do things that fit, that fit in with the band. And that's the secret of a big band drummer. Now, you were with Gresh when you got, uh, Mel, the job with Stan Kenton? Yes. How was it that you had that kind of rapport with, uh, you know, these big band leaders? Well, I got to know Stan. When they came into the town, he played at the Paramount. I'd go down, and Shelley would take me backstage, and I'd talk to Stan. I got to know him fairly well. Uh, okay. 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 Here's uh, another name that played at the uh, Gresh drum night at Birdland, Art Blakey. Yeah, oh, Art. Right. <laughs> Uh, he's everybody's all-time drummer. <laughs> he was a individualist, a soloist, and uh, not the greatest technician by far, but he made up for all that with his ideas and his, and his innovations and his way he did things. And he had, a, you know, when he made a roll, when he made a roll, it wasn't the greatest roll, but... <laughs> It was. Uh, it did things for you. It was pretty powerful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what it lacked in technique, it had made up for in power. Right? That's right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he was quite a guy. I loved art. Now, um, when you collected these guys at this uh, Gresh drum night at, at Birdland, uh, did you ever have a problem dealing with all these egos that you had there? No, not really. No. Um... Art Blakey never had a real ego. Mel Lewis never had one. Philly Joe, are we, are we, are we going to get to him? Yes, yeah, yeah, he was one of my next ones here. I don't think that there, there's too many uh, ego problems with the uh, Lewis, uh, Chico Hamilton. Tell me about him. That's another one I wanted to talk to you about, Chico. Uh, Chico, to the advantage of a drummer being a leader, he can do anything he wanted to. Nobody going to complain. Now, would you say he pioneered using mallets? Because I know Art Blakey and a lot of the guys used mallets. Did, do you think Chico, would you classify him as sort of a pioneer of using mallets? Well, I never saw Art Blakey use mallets. Uh, uh, Chico's the only one that played the uh, the the tom-toms the, uh, like a timpani. Yes. You follow me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, how about Roy Hart? No, he's West Coast pretty much, and Sam Milano the same thing. Oh, Sam! <laughs> no, it's Sam. Sam, uh, he was one of my best friends. Um, he was a when I first met him, he was, he was strictly a drum teacher, and he uh, he played uh, he played in the club in New York. What was it? He uh, one of those clubs. Uh, uh, Oh, I forget. It wasn't uh, play. Yeah, it was a Playboy Club, was it? One of those clubs. Anyway, he was a pretty good drummer, good technique, mm -hmm. and uh, he was a wild guy with his ideas. He wrote books. You know, you, you had to slow him down. He was always uh, two steps around the corner from you. <laughs> How about uh, uh, Chuck Flores? Didn't Black player. No. no. Okay. Bill Richmond? No. Jimmy Pratt? Jimmy Pratt, okay. He was a, another big band drummer. Very good. He played with... Uh, oh. Oh, Les, Les Brown. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was one of Les Brown's drummers. He, uh, he, he had some good ideas, original ideas. He invented the Jimmy Pratt tone control. It was a, a bass drum tone control that was adjustable. Are you feeling familiar at all with that? I am. Yeah, okay. And let me see something else that he uh, came up with. Can't think of it right off well, Let me ask you about let me ask you about the uh, the guys that were inventing this kind of equipment like like Jimmy like Jimmy Pratt. What did they I mean, were they spending a lot of time in the factory that they would be, you know, tinkering around with this stuff or or how did that come about? Well, let's see. Uh, 
I don't remember all the details on Jimmy Pratt. He he was one of the few fellows that uh, whose ideas that that I think it was the only idea that, like that that we uh, that we used on the uh, production line. And I can't remember just the details of how we went about it. I I don't remember. Except I think he had some kind of a model of it, and they came over to the factory and showed it, and, and we were quick to pick it up. But I, uh, I think Jimmy was the only one that uh, that had uh, had an idea for something inside in the drum outfit itself that uh, that uh, was unusual. Now there was an article in Modern Drummer back in '84 that said uh, that uh, after the war there. Was the Gresh set up two-man teams, and you went around to the clubs and asked the guys what they needed and what they wanted, and that's how a lot of the product innovation came about. Is is that true? Do you do you recall that? No, I was the only one that went around. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, how about a fellow by the name of uh, Charlie Smith? Doesn't ring a bell. Okay. I I I it sort of rings a bell, but I I can't place him. That's fine. Um. Here's one I know you'll have a lot to say about because he also participated in the Gresh Drum Nights, Elvin Jones. Elvin, yeah. Oh, you had to be very... <laughs> with Elvin, you never know where the hell he was going to be from one minute to the other. <laughs> he had a problem. He spent some time in Rikers Island as a result of they being caught with dope. Mm-hmm. And he'd come to a job and get half-bombed and and, and he, he was a real problem, and, but uh, he overcome all he overcome all that with uh, with the way he played. And he was a it was it was you know nobody nobody played the way Elvin Jones played. Nobody. He had his, just his own style, and he was strictly a small group drummer. And uh, when he was right, when he was healthy, nobody could play better than he. About Jack Adams. Well, Jack Adams was the proprietor of Jack's Drum Shop in Boston, Mass. Right. And uh, he and I were very good friends. And uh, he, Doug Gretsch, and uh, and so we made him the sole distributor of Gretsch drums in the Boston area. And he did a hell of a job for us. He was a drummer himself. He played at some clubs around Boston. He he wouldn't scare Elvin Jones to death. He's just an ordinary drummer. A nice guy. Good merchandiser, but he was listed as one of the endorsers. Did the yeah, we, we 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 ran his ad. Yeah. Sometimes you did that just to uh, just to, to appease the because Roy Hart also had a drum shop in the, in the West Coast, and I, I think maybe that's probably how he got an endorsement. Yeah. Uh, Herb Brockstein. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So these guys were just uh, uh, merchandisers and big merchandisers for you and. And that's how they essentially got their endorsement. Is yeah, right? we yeah. we ran small ads at one time. Right. And we ran several of them. And rather than taking the full page, we'd run, we'd have three or four ads, and down the there were smaller ads, and that's why we could afford to have more personnel in the ads. Right. How about Max Roach? Max was a, an excellent drummer, and he was with us quite a number of years, and he was a problem. With his physical, with his uh, life, mm -hmm. and uh, we used—I I forget it, whether we used him down uh, in Birdland or not. He says he never he, that he did play those. He did play um, uh, the Gresh Drum Night. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And uh, but uh, towards the end, he he decided uh, he never gave me a chance to do anything about it. He decided he said, "I'm going to leave Gretch for another company." And uh, it really made me unhappy. I, I, prior to coming with you, I believe he was with WFL. Right. I lured a lot of lured lured a lot of guys away because they were in New York, and it was easy for me to lure them away. Ludwig's in Chicago. Not too many of the drummers would be playing in Chicago as compared to New York. Ah. So it was very easy for me to work with these guys and, and lure them over to Gretsch. 
Now, what was the promise that you would make to a guy to lure him over? Was it just equipment, or did you? Did they? Were there money deals? No money. No money. No. Nobody ever got a dime. Just equipment. Their own personal equipment. Uh, once a year. Now, it why? Was why was it? Do you think the guys wanted to do it? Because I know WFL was paying. I know they were paying Buddy Rich a sizable amount of money to to get him as an endorser. Well, they paid him a a, a blanket sum, and when Buddy Rich left, uh, Ludwig. I went down to talk with him, and uh, and I didn't. I don't. I don't. I never did like Buddy. He's an egotistical son of a bitch. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, "I'll play Gretsch drums or anybody else's drums for for five thousand bucks. You just play me five thousand dollars, and that's all there is to it." Well, uh, we don't do business that way. I said to myself, "Jesus, you know, we don't pay the guys, and if you pay one of them, then you got to pay all the rest of them." And, and otherwise, you're going to have uh, some unhappy drummers. So, and then I talked. Bill Ludwig called me up, and he said, "He said, Phil, you take my advice and stay away from that guy. He's no goddamn good." Mm -hmm. And by that time, I didn't need that advice. I stayed away from him. <laughs> but, you know, he was. A, but, uh, I'll say this for him: he's a hell of a drummer. Yep. Oh. He was a natural drummer. Probably the greatest drum set player of all time, I would say. Oh, yeah, no question about it. And Louis Belson might be second, but uh, nobody's nobody gonna beat uh, Buddy Rich. Technique. Yeah. The whole thing. Yeah. How was it that uh, uh, you know, since since you weren't paying these guys, what, how do you think you got so many of them? It was just because of the proximity. You were you were close enough to lure them away. You must have been a good salesman. I was. <laughs> I well, like that. Those, those guys like to uh, to be flattered, and they like to be worked with. And I go down, and, and, and a lot of them came out to my house. You know, I mean, it wasn't a question of uh, the, uh, the business thing. It became a personal thing. Huh. And a lot of these guys are, like Louie, you know, we, we, like he, he'll tell you, we were just good friends. And, and my, my wife would... Uh, cook for them and they'd come out to the house and play with my kids and all that and it was it was a, it became a personal thing uh-huh and that's when they when one of them would leave i took it very personally <sighs> huh. i'll be darned this is very one time we had of the top 10 drummers in the country we had eight pretty incredible my company was unhappy with me because so many of them were black but i said uh Hey. The, the white drummers, uh, they they don't care what color the guy is. They, they like uh, Art Blakey, whether he's black or whatever. Right. Right. How about, uh, you talked a little bit about Philly Joe. How is he to work with? Well, he was... <laughs> he... He was just too much. Uh, you have to You have to put up with an awful lot with some of these guys, and Philly Joe, you know, he'd say, uh, give me a couple of cymbals. And I know what has happened to the cymbals. You give it to them, they'll, they'll wind up in the hawk shop in 6th Avenue <laughs> to, to supplement his dope habit. <laughs> so it, it was a, with Philly Joe, it, it's, uh, you know, you, you just had to figure, well, that's Philly Joe. If, you're gonna, if you want him, you got to put up all this crap. He's not going to change. Right. Until he dies. But uh, but Philly, I, I loved his drumming. I thought he was great. Let's get back to Max Roach. There was something that, before I move on here, there was something I wanted to ask you about. Now, um, there was a Max Roach snare drum. Yeah, it was a, it was a, a narrow one. Right, four inches. Tell me yeah, about yeah. that. How did that come about? Do you recall? Yeah, well, he just said he wanted the smaller drum the way he played would, would, would fit his style better. There was no question. It's easy to make the shell, five-inch shell, you just cut down another inch. you got to make sure that you have the lugs that will fit the, the, uh, the, 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 the lugs will work. You know, you have enough space there to tension the drum. Now, initially, that, that lug was, was made, was like a tubular lug. It looked similar to the, um, the Gladstone lug. On the on the original Max Roach snare drums. Yeah. 
then later on they came out with a lug that was similar to the lugs that were on all the rest of the drums. I think our snare drum lug, five inch snare drum lug, would fit the four inch. But maybe when we first made it, we had a, some tubular lugs there that were left over from something or other. Uh -huh. Because a four inch drum had been around for years and years. Yeah, that wasn't new. It was just reintroduced by Max. Okay. Okay. How about Jimmy Cobb? Jimmy Cobb. There's a darling. There's a great guy. Good drummer, good technique, good hands, everything. And one of the, the best gentlemen, he was the supreme gentleman of all the drummers, even more so than Louis. And loyal and good and uh, never asked for anything, always uh, laid back, an excellent drummer. He was with Miles. He was one of Miles' best drummers. So I, <laughs> Miles called me up once. I got to know Miles pretty well, you know, hanging around Birdland and whatnot. And Miles called me up one. You, you ever hear him talk? Yes. He, grubble, he, well, he says, Bill, <clears throat> this is Miles. Miles Davis. Hey, Phil, you got to fix up my boy Jimmy Cobb with a set of drums. Rogers wants to give him a set of drums and have my picture taken with it. I don't want my picture to go taken with no shit ass set of drums. <laughs> How about Jay Canna? Well, that goes back a ways, and we used Jake at some time early on, and uh, but it didn't last. I can't tell you why. I think he must have switched. I'd have to rank him too high as a drummer. How about um, Sonny Payne with Count Basie? Sonny, yeah, good drummer. I think he was a. I think he was a. Regardless of what Joe Jones might say, I think Sonny was the best uh, Count Basie drummer. Uh, he, he really sparked the band, and he pushed the band. You know, the band c has a tendency to get a little lazy, you know. They, they do all those riffs, and first thing you know, they're, they're slowing down and, uh, and not keeping up the tempo. But Sonny would push them. I, I like the way he did things. Yeah, he's a nice guy. How would you how would you rank him technically? He was better than average, uh, better than Don Lamont and Mel Lewis. Uh, you put him up there with Belson? No. No. Okay. How about Sam Woodyard with the uh, with the uh, with the Duke? Sam was a good technician, good drummer. Now he was a Gresh endorser. Is that correct? Correct. How did nope. you how did how did you go about getting him? Do you remember? I'm trying to think. I remember Duke was playing down at the Cafe Society downtown. That was in the village. And I went down there and I met him. And I met Sam. I think Sam was playing Ludwig uh, Slingland. And I talked him into playing Gretsch. It wasn't very hard. I had some help from the Ellington. That's about all I can tell you on Sam. I don't know how long we ha were with Sam. I really don't know. Right. Of course, you know, I've been up here 22 years. Uh, my memory's pretty good, but every once in a while, I, 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 uh, there'll be some lapse there. In the, oh, I gosh, don't you're, remember. No, you're, you're coming up with some, some wonderful stuff here. I'm, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. This will be just yeah. really wonderful stuff for the book. How about a fellow by the name of uh, Art Taylor? Oh, Art, yeah. Hang a second. My, my Greyhound wants to go out. Please, go yeah. ahead. Sure. Art Taylor is strictly a, a combo drummer, small band drummer. Good, good, pretty good technique, good ideas. Not outstanding. I mean, he wasn't a, he wasn't like Art Blakey or Elvin Jones who were sort of uh, stylists, you know, who would pioneer something their own way. I mean, he, and he's a drummer something like, uh, like uh, that last fellow we're talking about, like Jimmy Cobb. Oh, Jimmy Cobb? 
Yeah. Uh-huh. And then Art, we sort of lost track of him because he moved. He's one of those. He was like Clue Clark. He he loved Europe because he's a big shot over there. You know, he was played the clubs over there and and uh, you get a couple of white chicks. You know that. You know, it's, it's, uh, he had it made over there. Uh-huh. About Charlie Persson. Yeah, good drummer. Charlie. Good. We're, Charlie and I are good friends. Um, I don't know what happened to him. I sort of lost track. He's still around. I, I got him to uh, agree to do an interview. He, he kind of scared me because, uh, you know, I told him that I was going to call you for an interview, and he says, oh, Chet, he says, I think I think Phil died. And I said, oh, God, no. And, <laughs> and so uh, he'll be real glad. To, he says, no, I'm not sure. He says, so, you know, please check it out because I'd love to talk with him again. No, oh, I yeah, Charlie. I liked him very much. He was a good drummer, good hands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about some of the later guys? Maybe they. Uh, I don't know if the experience you had with them, but they were rock and rollers. Uh, Charlie Watts with the Rolling Stones. Yeah, I never did meet him. But we uh, we advertise. We had a permission to use his name in advertising, and we we advertised him. But he was, of course, in England, and when they came over here, I never did uh, did make contact with him. Okay, or Phil Collins, same thing. He was from England. He's a rock and roller, played yeah. fresh drums. Yeah, don't know him. Okay. How about some other people inside the company? Duke Kramer. <laughs> yeah, he was run, He ran the Chicago office. <laughs> and towards, towards the end, we uh, there were a lot of hard feelings when... Uh, a lot of things happened when uh, Fred sold the company to, to, to Baldwin. You've got to realize that, uh, you know, things, when things are, are that, find out the true character of a person. When things are going good, every, everybody can be a nice guy and, you know, you get along congenial. But when things get rough, and then, uh, then you find out who, who your friends are. Uh, when Fred sold out to Baldwin in 1967 or 68, mm -hmm. I'm not sure I have the right date on that. That Probably that article in the Modern Drummer will have that date. Yeah, they said 67. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty close. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of personalities got involved, in, and, and, one thing, uh, and business started to slow down. Not too long after Baldwin bought it, for, for Fred made four million bucks out of the thing, and uh, four million at that time was a lot of moolah. Maybe four million now isn't quite so much, but uh, and uh, Duke had a very unusual personality. When he when he would drink. He'd, 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 uh, all these things that were apparently pent up on him, it would come out and he would tell people off, like Jimmy Webster who worked for us. He told uh, Jimmy Webster off one time after he'd been drinking, then one time after he'd been drinking, he told me off, and he came up to visit me in, in, um, in right here in, in Middletown Springs a couple of years after Baldwin thing, but I left him, and he came up here and, and uh, told me what I, uh, off. So... He went to work for uh, Freddie Bill Gretsch. That's uh, uh, Fred's nephew. Right. And uh, Freddie Bill would uh, write me and call me, want to know my opinion on this and that. And I said, you got Duke working for you. Why don't you ask him? Well, Duke had no idea. He had no feeling for drums or guitars. He had feeling for merchandise as such, but not, not as the instrument, you know. And... Uh, we got along fairly well, but when the Baldwin thing came along, we had there was a lot of clashes of personality. And somebody said this, and they, they said, "Did you say this?" and all, all that. And it got to the point where I just couldn't stand it anymore, and that's when I got the hell out. Now, when when Fred sold the company to to Baldwin, how did it said in the in the Gresh article that he took care of you? Well. I'll tell you what happened, and you can determine whether he took care of it. Uh, uh, they sort of, uh, Fred wanted to hang around, but Baldwin didn't want him to hang around, and they made some snide remarks to him and all that. And uh, when uh, Baldwin...
Feldman finally closed down the Brooklyn plant, they gave all the employees there some uh, some uh, money towards the end as a uh, gratitude thing, you know, as a, uh, what, what do you call it? Severance? Yeah, severance pay. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. They didn't give me a nickel. <laughs> The, the day I quit, my pay stopped. So when Fred took care of me, um, Fred felt sorry. But Fred uh, Duke was still working with with Paul. He was going to stay on. He got a job, so it was to him. It was a job. You know, he, he well, no matter what they did, uh, he went along with it. But not me. I couldn't go along with all that crap. But when so Fred, uh, so uh, when I t- I sold my house, sold everything and moved up to Vermont, and uh, Fred felt sorry, and he gave me $5,000 worth of Baldwin stock. 5000 Wow. So I took the 5000 and cashed it in and bought, and to, to put it towards the down payment of the uh, store that I bought. So that's how he took care of me. Not really taken care of, is he? No. Not for what you did for that company? No. So I vowed then that I would never work for anybody else in my life again. Never. I'm not going to work for anybody else. I'm going to, if I can't make it on my own, to hell with it. God bless you. Thank you. What's the name of the store? Grant's. And what kind of merchandise? A little bit of everything. Groceries, hardware, clothing. A little bit of everything. General store. Uh Uh-huh. No drums. No drum. <laughs> <laughs> I still play up here. We have a country show a couple times a year. I still play. But that's all. Country? Yeah, the country show. Singing, dancing, country jokes, skits, whatnot. Uh-huh. Not country music? No. Okay. Well, yeah. Yeah, but I don't, I don't play... I don't know if there's such a thing as playing country drums. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't guess there no. particularly is, no. no. Okay. Um... What about this Emerson Strong that Louis Belson kept referring to? Who was who Emerson? What did he do in the company? Well, he's with the company all his life. He was, uh, like I told you, he was the vice president. Right. And he was a, he was a wonderful guy. Really one of my best friends. A wonderful guy. He never got things done right. Uh, he, he was supposed to put out catalogs, and he was always late with them, and he t- took care of the advertising. And he, and he just sort of did things in within the company that had to be done. Well, I can't tell you exactly what. We had a, uh, well, a lot of things that were involved in the company. We had a, uh, a fellow who did our, uh, our patents. We had a patent attorney. Because I had, uh, let's see, I had three or four patents. And Jimmy Webster, our guitar promotion, had about seven or eight patents. Did you know about my patent? No, tell me about them. Uh, the the, uh, disa- the uh, disappearing spurs. Yes. That was one. Uh, the uh, snapping drum keys snaps right into the drum shell right. and locks. Right. So that's the second one. Now these are things you developed. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. All height symbol holder. There was no. I think that. No, I don't know. If that was a. Let me see what else was there. Now that the all height simple holder, that's the one that mounted on the shell. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I had to turn the patents over to the company. I never got anything for them. That's which is typical, right, of Gretsch. Right. Now uh, Wahlberg and OJ was the manufacturer of all their hardware. Is that correct? Well, not all of it. Uh, they made our drum stands, our hi hats. And a lot of other things of that nature. I believe Camco made your pedals. Right. right. The floating action pedal. Right. Now, it said in the Gresh article that even though Camco, it was the same pedal, that guys would argue that the Gresh pedal was better. Yeah. That, that shows you how the mentality of the <laughs> <laughs> It had a name on it, right? Yeah. Well, um, Wahlberg, uh, he and I worked, uh, Clarence Wahlberg, who was the uh, head of the company, he and I worked quite closely together to develop things, come up with a, uh, with a, uh, with a hi-hat, with an improved hi-hat, improved snare drum stand. 
How was the right? hi hat improved? What did it do? It had a much uh, heavier, much heavier material metal in it. Right. And it had a a, 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 a big foot pedal, a foot uh, foot. Uh, you know what I mean? The pedal. The yeah. actual pedal, right? Yeah. The right. Pedal. Now let's get back to the catalogs for a second. You said a lot of times the catalogs didn't come out in time. Mm -hmm. uh, it, I also believe sometimes, now you can correct me here, but sometimes the, the information in the catalog itself wasn't correct because they had three-ply shells in the catalogs all through the 50s until 1961 is when they claim they came out with the six-ply shell. Are you sure? You, you have documents to sustain that? I've got the catalogs. Uh-huh. I'll be damned. Now, I have always thought that the six-ply came about in the 50s. It did. That's what I thought. Absolutely. It came about shortly after I joined the company that we got the shells from Jasper. Oh, my dog wants to get back That's in. That's fine. Go Hang ahead. On. That's fine. I have a, an X-Racer Greyhound dog. Great dogs. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you can hear mine barking in the background, but he's raising a fuss. I think he feels like he's being ignored there. <laughs> Well, I, I don't know, uh, like I like say, Emerson was in charge of the catalogs, and he'd be working on one three years later would come out. So <laughs> there, there, was that, there was that lapse of time in there that, uh, you know, the things that were changed, and they were changed, and by the time the catalog came out, they were, they were, they were changed considerably. Right, right. But... Uh, uh, Emerson, I, I I do anything for him. I loved him, you know, but he he didn't get things done on time. So I finally did some of the things on my own, little flyers and whatnot that that, that I couldn't wait for him to do because I know it would take him for day for days and day weeks and weeks to get it done. So I would do them on my own. Let me ask you about a couple more people here, and I'll let you go. I've taken up a lot of your time, and I certainly yeah. appreciate you doing this for me. Um, how about uh, Bill Hagler? Bill Hagner, yeah, factory superintendent. Over both uh, guitars and drums, or just drums? Oh, yeah, the whole thing, the whole factory. Okay. Now, Freddie, uh, Freddie Bill said that he was Bill Hagler's assistant. Well, he can. He said a lot of things. <laughs> I, I suppose he could have been considered an assistant, but uh, okay. He was pretty young when uh, when uh, Fred Jr. sold the company, and, and of course he went to. He said he went to uh, with Fred to, to Peter Luger uh, when Fred told him, you know, that, 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 that he was selling the company. He says, "Well, I want the company," but uh, of course Fred Jr. was probably uh, eyeballing that four million dollars. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, when when Fred retired, he went to work uh, full time for the bank. Is that correct? Correct. Now, he had been working part-time with the Lincoln Bank prior to that, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. He was on the board of directors. Right. His father was, too. Right. Yeah, the bank was there. Fred Sr. was uh, uh, was, a, was a banker. He wasn't He wasn't a good uh, uh, fact, drum and guitar manufacturer. He was second rate, really second rate. I guess he was a good banker. Like Ogden Nash says, bankers are like anybody else, only a richer. <laughs> now, how would you qualify Fred Jr.? Wasn't a drummer. No. He... Or a guitarist. I mean, he wasn't a musician. No, he right? wasn't Just a musician. Just a businessman. He, Fred was a very smart guy. But he didn't always do smart things. You know, no, you could go to him and uh, he'd give you answers that were that were that were very correct and, and well thought out. Very smart guy, hmm. but he do he would do things that weren't smart. Another question for you. Now the the factory was at 160 Broadway, but I'm told during the 60s, during the boom years of the 60s, the drums were located on South Fifth Street. Is that correct? No, South Fifth Street was a storage place. Ah. The drums were uh, were never moved out of 60 Broadway until the whole factory was moved out in 1969 or 8 and moved to Boonville, Arkansas. Now, were you still with them at that point? When did you leave the company? 72. So you went down to Boonville, Arkansas? I didn't go there regularly. Now, see, Bill Hagner went there. Mm -hmm. And he took his assistant with him. Not, not Freddie Bill. Mm -hmm. But Baldwin wasn't very smart. 
I don't know how many people know this. Bill Hagner was a factory superintendent, and he stayed in his office the whole time, generally speaking, working with figures. I don't know if he was, all figures he, he moved, but he didn't know anything that went very much that went on to the factory. In other words, he couldn't go to a foreman and say, look, you should use this thing on here and this thing on here. You're using the wrong bit and all that. He had no idea of, of the foreman's uh, operations. The foremans were the heart and soul of the, of the, of the company. You, you could hire all sorts of workers. As long as you had a good foreman, that, that you had a good factory. And when Baldwin decided to move the factory to Arkansas, they made a feeble attempt to, to, to take these foremen to Arkansas. But it wasn't a good enough attempt. In fact, it was a half-ass attempt. Now, the foremen, were all, all the foremen were Italians. They had a lot of ties in, in around the uh, New York City area. They all lived there. And, uh, and these foremen were all excellent foremen, excellent. We had a plating foreman, we had a wood shop foreman, a metal, for, metal shop foreman, and they were all excellent. So Baldwin didn't really make an a, a all-out effort to, to move these foremen down to Arkansas. I don't know whether they ever would have gone, but, but maybe they could have made a better effort. Maybe they, one, or, one or two of them might have gone. Who knows? Mm -hmm. uh, a few more things here. This also regards the catalogs not being uh, up to date. The, the 1958 catalog was the silver anniversary, mm -hmm. meaning that the company was, what, 75 years old, obviously, at that time. Yep. There was a special finish made up for that. It was called the Anniversary Sparkle. It was Correct. Kind of a black with little silver flakes in it. Or That's gold great. flakes. I'm right. not sure which one it was. Mm -hmm. Silver plates, yep. Not in the catalog. No. <laughs> Yeah, well, it, 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 uh, see, uh, the, the outfit that made our pearl uh, sheet, I went up there with uh, with the factory superintendent, and uh, we were looking over what could be done, and that's why I decided to, to have that uh, anniversary that, uh, as a uh, anniversary uh, item. Who was the company? Do you recall what the name of the company was that you were dealing with there? I'm not sure I can remember that. Okay. I. Uh, It'll come to me sometime or other. How could it not be in the catalog, though? I mean, well, I mean, that, that that that's possible because you 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 go up there, you make a decision, you, you get delivery in two weeks on, on the on the pearl, and, and you're and you're making drums, and it's not in the catalog. That's possible. Uh -huh. Well, the fact that it wasn't in the catalog wasn't too important because it was only uh, for, uh, use it for during the anniversary year anyway. Ah, okay. So it, it, it wasn't it wasn't too hot an item. It was just something different. It is now, boy. The collectors are just going crazy trying to trying to find those drums. Really? Those and those Max Roach drums and the Billy Gladstone drums. And yeah, I wish I'd have had kept on my Billy Gladstone snare drum. You had one? Oh, sure. Now when I was an I was an endorser of the Gretsch Company uh, when I was in the Golden Band. Right. Now that was a Gretsch Gladstone drum. Correct. Right. And that's the one you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Now let's let's get back to that. You made a statement that, that that's pretty impressive because I know the caliber. Although I never got to see Billy Gladstone play, I know the caliber of of of, of uh, percussionist that he was. You said you were number two. Yeah, that's quite a statement. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think Billy Gladstone would have seconded that. Huh? Now. It, because I never got to see him play, I mean, I'm old enough to have, but I was chasing after Belson and Rich and, and Joe Morello and those kind of guys when I, when, when I was in my younger years. I never got to see him play. Comparing him to, like, you know, I saw Buddy Rich play many, many times. As far as having that kind of power, the, the, those kind of hands, is, is, that, is that what, is that the caliber of, of, of snare drummer that he was? Oh, yeah. Better, would yeah. you say? Well, you know, he's, Billy's a different kind of a snare drummer right. than... Uh, it's hard to compare uh, right. apples and oranges, yeah. but uh, you're just talking about hands. Uh, Billy Gladstone had superb hands. I, uh, and uh, the funny thing about Billy Gladstone... Not a funny thing. I used to sub at Radio City Music Hall, 
and they liked me as a sub because I could, I had a fantastic uh, knowledge of, of, of ability to, to sight read. I could go in there and sight read anything, and I would play it better than than the guy that was uh, that was uh, the regular one. I played uh, I was going there and I'd play timpani, mm -hmm. and you had uh, there were three percussionists there. The uh, Billy on snare drum as a bass drum and cymbal and the timpani. And the, the percussion score had all three parts on, on the same thing. On, so you could see what the, what the bass drummer and cymbal player and the snare drum were doing. So in case you, you, you wanted to know where he, it was easy to follow uh, to the music. Uh, well, I'm not explaining that very well. It's sort of, sort of like a, it's a cue to where you're going to play. Right. So, but Billy was an inventor. And I go there, and I'm, and I'm seeing uh, my part, and I'm looking at what he's supposed to be playing, but he's not playing. He's not playing that. He's inventing. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, I said, Billy asked me, hey, Billy, uh, well, you were supposed to do this. He said, ah, what did I do? So I do it <laughs> he, was, he was inventing. And I, I was playing there, and, and, and all of a sudden he stops what he's doing and come over to me, and he, and he whispers, hey, you're playing great, Phil. And he, he stopped playing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he, yeah, I, I was a great fan of his. I think he was a good fan of mine, too. Now, there's rumor that he couldn't read. Is that true? Yeah, well, uh, almost. Uh, I, I think that uh, a, lot of, a lot of musicians... Uh, if they had that sort of thing where they invented things, uh, like, uh, well, a jazz musician, uh, improvise. He's not going to read very well because he's always improvising. Right. Now, Billy, uh, he didn't, the reason he didn't read very well, he was always improvising. In other words, he didn't stick to what he was supposed to be doing. He was inventing something better. <laughs> and it truly was better, right? Oh, well, I don't know, but if I were a conductor, it would drive me crazy because, you, you know, you're expecting to hear something, and you're hearing something else. How did you get away with it? Well, he, he played so well that nobody's going to make an issue of it. Quite a show drummer, too. I mean, high-sticking and all that kind of stuff, too. Oh, right? yeah. 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 Hmm. You know, I, I was a, a good substitute there because, first of all, I didn't want the job full-time, so they weren't... Somebody was afraid that I was going to take the job away from him. <laughs> and when I was a kid learning to play drums, I would go through a drum book and I would sight read the whole book and then throw it aside and then sight read another book and throw it aside. So I got to be a, an exceptionally good reader, a player, a sight reader. You must have just had a God-given talent. Yeah. Yeah, certain was that. Yeah. And I worked at it, too, but... You have to have talent to begin with. Right. People sure speak of your playing as just uh, something to behold. Mm. No, thanks. Something to behold. That's why when you said I was number two, I thought, well, I'm glad. You know, a lot of guys are very humble, and they won't say, you know, I was number two. And by God, if you were, you should say you were. <laughs> you know, that's what well, I yeah. feel about Well, I didn't mind being number two to Billy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, those, that, those are quite... But Billy, Billy, he, he couldn't go to a symphony orchestra. I mean, he, he they, those guys at Radio City, they learned the show, they learned the show, and they almost played it like uh, they were thinking about something else. They could play the show. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. With a symphony orchestra, you have a different, uh, different, uh, different uh, 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 concert every week and different music every week. So you, you, you just can't be uh, sitting back there and, and uh, doing something that you did last week. You think that's why he was mustered out when Rappé died? When who died? The the conductor was it was it wasn't his name Rappé or Rappé or? Oh yeah, I didn't. I lost contact by then, so okay. I I don't I don't know. Okay. Well, Billy died. Let's see what. Billy died when? Sixty-one or sixty-two? Yeah. Yeah, before Radio City. Uh, but he left them, you know, back in the. In the 40s. Did he? Yeah. Oh, no. I, I was playing there in the 50s, and he was still there. At Radio City? Mm-hmm. I forget when the last time I saw there. Maybe it was the late 40s. I, I don't know, but he was there. Huh. I'll be darned. He was there. And uh, did you, did you were going to ask me about Manny's musical instrument and accessories? Uh, no, why don't you tell me about it? What's that? 
Well, Manny um, was on 48th Street. Right. They had the biggest uh, music store on 48th Street. Not the biggest. It was a well. He, he he sold more than anybody else did. And Manny was a very smart guy. And uh, and Gretsch was very smart. They hooked up with him right away and gave him exclusive on Gretsch Gladstone and Gretsch drums. And he had it exclusive for many years until uh, 19. Oh, during the guitar and drum boom in the 60s. And then we took the uh, exclusive away from him and then passed it around to everybody else on the street. But by that time, he was buying everything else, too, because you couldn't get delivery from Ludwig, and so you buy Gretsch, and you couldn't get delivery from Gretsch, and you buy Slingland, you buy whatever you could get hold of. Right. No matter what you bought, it was going to sell. And of course, that was good for the business and there and again it was bad for the business but Manny was a very smart merchandiser very smart and of course when he when all those fellas in uh, on the uh, 48th street when they came when the uh, developer came along they bought them out and they made tons of money all those those rundown buildings on 48th street or like Manny's place and across the street and all the musical instrument companies mm -hmm. Yeah, they made big money. Manny made big money. Hmm. And he moved this store down to where the, uh, t past where all that development was taking place, closer to uh, 7th Avenue. Have you, uh, do you know that? Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Hmm. Well, Mr. Grant, this has been very enlightening. I've got some great material here. I certainly appreciate you. You've talked a long time. You're probably a tongue tired right now and I really I, am. <laughs> I really appreciate you you doing this for me this will be a lot of good material for the book because I knew you were pretty much the kingpin of that operation and 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 it sheds an awful lot of light you know they they claimed that it was all their uh, merchandise all their innovative uh, ideas which is probably true but it sounds more like you uh, you were the, the the PR person you were the person that was really putting that Gresh name out there because a drum is a drum. You tune up a drum, you know, you could tune up a Ludwig drum, and it'll sound as good as tuning up a good Gresh drum. If you know how to tune a drum, it's going to sound good. But, uh, uh, you know, moving the merchandise, uh, it sounds like you were, uh, you were the, the, the integral person there. Yeah. You, you know what, what, what uh, didn't kill the Gladstone drum, because by that time uh, the other, they were buying other things. But Billy's uh, invention... Was, was at that time was uh, was superb. In other words, you tighten both heads of the one uh, with one with one part of the key, tighten the top head with one part of the key, and tighten the uh, snare head with another part of the key. Absolutely uh, innovative. Uh, but of course, when the plastic heads came along, the, the three-way tension doesn't mean a damn thing. Right. He continued making them though, on his own up until he died in the 60s, yeah. early 60s. Yeah, he still bought the shells from us. Yeah. Yeah, he really and liked the hoops. The... And the hoops. See, see, our hoops were die cast. Right. Slinglands and Ludwig's were stamped out. That's why ours were perfectly formed around the ear, you know, where the rod goes through. Right. Yeah. With Ludwig's and Slingland, uh, Slingland wasn't quite so bad, but Ludwig made no attempt to... To, to form that thing. Ludwig's hoops were terrible. Of course, the only thing, the only bad part about the die cast hoop, you, you wanted to go into other sizes, you, you got to spend uh, $8,000 for a die. <laughs> with, a, uh, with the hoops that Ludwig has, they could make any size. Sure. That, that was their, to uh, their advantage and to our disadvantage. But I finally got Fred to make a 16 inch. Uh, uh, well, we had a 16-inch, made an 18-inch, and then a 20-inch die-cast hoop. Now, I have one last thing that just came to my mind. I'm glad I thought of it before I hung up, and, and then, I'll, then I'll stop this because I've asked you too many questions already. But, but about the K-Zildjian symbols, mm -hmm. I was, I've been told that they, you know, one out of 100 was, was decent, and you were the best at picking that one and bringing it to the likes of Art Blakey and whomever. Well, yeah, part of that is true. I used to pick out their symbols, but uh, it wasn't that tough to pick them out. If you knew, uh, you had to like the you had to like the K Zildjian sound because it was completely different than Avidus Zildjian symbol the sound. Completely different. Do, mm -hmm. do you know why? Why don't you explain it to me? I want to hear what your explanation is on it. 
the uh, the K Zildjian was hand hammered, and it uh, it wasn't as high a pitch as the Abbot of Zildjian. It wasn't as high a pitch, and uh, it had a more sustaining sound. And the, I think a lot of it had to do with the hand hammering that they did in Istanbul, mm -hmm. which they didn't do on the Abbot of Zildjian symbol. Mm -hmm. But uh, it had a, a dark, I, I would almost call it a darker sound, right. uh, more of a resonant sound. It would, it would ring more. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you liked the Ks, you liked them. If you liked the Abbotus, you wouldn't like the Ks. It was simple as that. Right. But uh, you get used to it, the sound of the K Zildjian, you wouldn't use it after the Zildjian. Because it was so much different. Mm -hmm. then, I, then I had that sizzle cymbal, which a lot of the drummers liked. You know, you put holes in the cymbal and you put rivets in. Right. Okay, Mr. Grant. Uh, uh, wow. I know that's a lot of talking. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'll send you a copy when it's when it's published. Now, it'll probably take time. Yep. I've got a year to write it, and they have a year to publish it, so it could be as much as two years, but it'll probably be less than that. I won't. I won't have to call Emerson Strong, though, will I? No, you won't have to call Emerson <laughs> Strong. No, 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 no. I won't turn any. The only person that really wants to talk. There were two people. Louis Belson wanted to talk to you, and so no, did no, Charlie. No, no, well, you're talking about what's going to take another year. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen you on that one, okay. You did, you yeah, did. All right. <laughs> All, right. All right, Mr. Grant, thanks so much. <laughs> yeah. I really appreciate this. So long. All right, bye-bye.